Hello readers, it's Sasha and today I am going to be filming my Goodreads Chooses My November TBR. So as always, I do a TBR game that involves Goodreads and involves my want to read list. And essentially, I just put the number of books I have in my want to read list into a random number generator. And the first five numbers that come up correspond to the books I'm going to read in the month. And I do always have only five rounds. I do feel like five is reasonable for where I'm at right now in terms of school and everything like that because sometimes I will be doing like secret TBR vlogs and stuff like that so I like to leave my options pretty open. I also have the Winers book club pick for the month which I always go over at the end so I always just start off with five books and I've also added a wild card number as well where essentially I will just pick a number between zero and nine from the random number generator and that number will be like my bad number and essentially if I land on any numbers that end in that number I will have to add an extra book to the TBR and as well I also have to add other books if they're not out yet like if the books on my to read list aren't out yet that is also a thing so this is going to be a lot of fun I absolutely adore doing these videos I find them so relaxing and not really I find them so entertaining and enjoyable and I just always love filming these so much so without further ado let's just dive right in so I've started recording I have everything that I need set up and ready to go so so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to pick my wild card number. So we start from zero and we put nine in and then let's see what it says. Eight. So our wild card number is going to be eight. So if I land on any number that ends in eight, I have to add an extra book to my TBR. So let me take a peek at how many books I have because this is honestly a little much. Okay. Yeah. I have 1,052 books. What is that? It literally just continues to go up. It doesn't matter any, it doesn't matter how many books I read. It just continuously goes up because there's always a new book out that I want to read. So <laughs> let's see what I'm going to be reading in November. Book number one. 782. Okay. So we're already starting off with one of our newer-ish editions. I guess it's really not that new anymore, but it's newer. We'll put it that way. Oh, oh no! no! The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet by Becky Chambers. Stuff. this is for you. This is 100% for you. Okay. I really genuinely did not think that I was gonna have to worry about reading an adult sci-fi in the month of November, but here I am. I think what I know about this is, oh, I thought it was fairly short. It's literally over 500 pages. Okay, that's T. All right. We follow a motley crew on an exciting journey through space and one adventurous young explorer who discovers the meaning of family in the far reaches of the universe in this lighthearted debut space opera from a rising sci-fi star. All right. Rosemary Harper doesn't expect much when she joins the crew of the aging Wayfarer. While the patched up ship has seen better days, it offers her a bed, a chance to explore the far off corners of the galaxy, and most importantly, some distance from her past. An introspective young woman who learned early to keep to herself, she's never met anyone remotely like the ship's diverse crew, including Sissix, the exotic reptilian pilot, chatty engineers Kizzy and Jenks, who keep the ship running, and Ashby, their noble captain. Life aboard the Wayfarer is chaotic and crazy, which is exactly what Rosemary wants. It's also about to get extremely dangerous when the crew is offered the job of a lifetime. Tunneling wormholes through space to a distant planet is definitely lucrative and will keep them comfortable for years, but risking her life wasn't exactly part of the plan. In the far reaches of deep space, the tiny Wayfarer crew will confront a host of unexpected mishaps and thrilling adventures that force them to depend on each other. To survive, Rosemary's got to learn how to rely on this assortment of oddballs, an experience that teaches her about love and trust, and that having a family isn't necessarily the worst thing in the universe. I don't know how to go about, like, I'm nervous, like, I'm really, really anxious about this because I'm not a big fan of adult sci-fi typically. However, this does seem really cute, and I did add it because it, the synopsis intrigued me the first time, and this is one of my dear, dear friends, like, one of her favorite sci-fis, I think. So, I... I'm nervous that I'm not going to like it, like, specifically for her, but I'm kind of excited at the same time. Like, I'll finally know, like, what her hype is about and what she's been, like, kind of going off about. So I'm interested. Okay, not a horrible way to start, but I've definitely had less anxiety. Now I just have to kind of keep going. So book number two is going to be 972. Can you imagine if two was my number? I would be crying. 
I've been adding like a lot more adult fiction lately and I think that's like kind of scaring me a little bit because there's a lot on this and I'm obviously if you've been on my channel for a while you know that I primarily read young adults so I definitely have anxiety going into this. I'm actually I'm really stressed. Okay Pepper shut the fuck up. 972 The Echo Wife by Sarah Gailey. So The Echo Wife I think it's a thriller. I think it's Oh, it's another science fiction. What is happening? Is November going to be my sci-fi month? Like, what the heck? Okay. Martine is a genetically cloned replica made from Evelyn Caldwell's award-winning research. She's patient and gentle and obedient. She's everything Evelyn swore she'd never be. And she's having an affair with Evelyn's husband. Now the cheating bastard is dead, and both Caldwell wives have a mess to clean up. Good thing Evelyn Caldwell is used to getting her hands dirty. That's, like, all there is to that. So, interesting. I... I don't know what this month is gonna be for me. This could be like a really great month where I'm just like, I'm discovering so much about myself or it could be like, I will never play this game again. All right, book number three. Okay, uh, <laughs> of course. This better be a good ass book. It's all I'm gonna say. Um, It's on page 500, so. My nerves are shot right now. Like, they're actually, like, I'm feeling just every type of way. Like, you'd literally think I was, like, finding out whether or not I made it into, like, my top college. No. I'm literally just finding out what I'm going to be reading for the month. And I also don't have to read them if I don't want to. Yet, I'm still here, like, freaking out. So, this is, like, more my comfort zone. Like, this page, I think. So, 478. Have you seen me? It's another adult. I'm just having, like, a really mature reading month. On a cold rainy morning, finance journalist Allie Linden arrives early to work in Manhattan, only to find that she's forgotten her key card and needs to have a colleague she's never met let her in. When her boss finally arrives, he seems surprised to see her because she hasn't worked there in five years. Allie knows her name but little else, and it's only after several hours in an emergency room and multiple interviews with the hospital psychiatrist that she begins to piece together important facts. She lives on the Upper West Side. She's now a freelance personal finance journalist. She's married to a lovely man named Hugh, and she still can't recall what's happened to her during the previous two days. When she learns that she's experienced a dissociative fugue state, Allie tries to think of triggers and remembers that she'd been seeing a therapist about a traumatic event from her childhood in which she came across evidence for a murder that was never solved. Desperate to unearth answers, Allie focuses on figuring out where she spent the missing 48 hours. As ominous details of the two days pile up, so does the terrifying pressure. She must recover the time she lost before the time she has left runs out. All right, so I obviously am a huge fan of mystery and thriller and adult fiction like mystery thrillers. I find them really fascinating. So it's probably my favorite genre, like mystery and thrillers are probably my two favorite genres of reading. I don't really care about the age group because I find young adult and adult brings completely different things to the table, but I'm excited for both. So I'm definitely interested. I know this intrigued me because specifically it was like she doesn't know where she's been. She has like kind of like an amnesia and I really like that trope. So I'm interested to see where this goes. It doesn't have like super duper high ratings, but that's okay because oftentimes I find myself really loving books that have like middle of the road or average ratings so i think this is gonna be good i'm interested all right so we're gonna move on to book number four now and remember i do have to add an extra book because i did get an eight on this one so let's see what i have to add or let's let's go to the next one it's fine <laughs> 879 okay so we're doing a lot of like books that i recently added which is kind of scary i'm nervous i'm just a nervous nelly i don't even remember the number 879 879 okay like i'm looking at these and i'm like i don't remember adding any of them <laughs> i have an addiction i'm just like want to read want to read want to read and i don't remember oh it's out oh my god i thought this wasn't out and i was gonna cry but it is out it's called sleeping around by morgan vega this is a young adult i think it yeah it just came out in august and has like no reviews it's super new wow coralie reed can't wait to trade her current foster house for harmony hall the dorm for music majors corey arrives at Bourne's college with her pawn shop violin and a borrowed duffel bag ready to leave her foster care baggage behind but corey's first day starts on a sour note she runs into her archival violinist dylan mason then her name's not on the dorm's roster worst of all corey can't live at harmony hall period because she's not yet accepted into the music program instead res life shoves her into a temporary triple with two unsuspecting and very different roommates when one of her roommates does the unforgivable corey starts sleeping around campus from air mattresses to random couches while waiting for an open room 
But how can she beat Dylan for first chair if she can't keep her eyes open? How can she pass her finals without a good night's sleep? Will college, the place she thought would launch her dreams of becoming a professional violinist, be the place her dreams end all too soon? Obviously, I really love hard-hitting contemporary. That's kind of like my jam right now. And I've always been fascinated in terms of the foster care and adoption type stories. I find them always to be very hard-hitting. I haven't read many, but whenever I do, I'm just, I'm always so blown away by it. So I'm really, really excited to read this. And I'm surprised it doesn't have like, any ratings or reviews like it has barely any like I'm really surprised about that because I thought it would be more popular that works for me I'm happy with that we can move on to what should have been my last pick but was not because I had to add another one so my second final pick let's go 724 okay everything is so nerve-wracking in this game I always see books while I'm waiting and I'm like oh my god I want to read that one and then I don't get that one but then I end up finding favorite books. So it's just like, I don't know. Like, it's all so great. Okay. Oh my god, that was... <laughs> it's been a while, sis. Okay, so You Will Remember Me is an arc that I got from HarperCollins. I am technically an influencer with them, but to be honest, I'm probably not going to continue with that because it's just a lot of pressure to, like, pick books and read them. I just like to read on my own. I just like to vibe on my own, so that's fine. But You Will Remember Me is an arc that I received, like, a few months ago now and I did not read it. He wakes up on a deserted beach in Maryland with a gash on his head and wearing only swim trunks. He can't remember who he is, everything. His identity, his life, his loved ones has been replaced by a dizzying fog of uncertainty. But returning to his main hometown in search of the truth uncovers more questions than answers. Lily Reed thinks she knows her boyfriend, Jack, until he goes missing one night and her frantic search reveals that he's been lying to her since they met. Desperate to escape a dark past he purposely left behind. Maya Scott has been trying to find her estranged brother, Asher, since he disappeared without a trace. Having him back, missing memory and all, feels like a miracle, but with a mutual history full of devastating secrets, how far will Maya go to ensure she alone takes him to the grave? So, again, I requested this one specifically because of the amnesia trope. I really do enjoy that. I think it's going to be like a dual perspective or like multiple POV um, book, and I'm interested to read it. It's been... I feel like Steph also read this one. Yeah, so I'm interested to see, and then I can talk to her about it because... I haven't really heard much about this book other than what Steph said because she's also an influencer for HarperCollins. So I'm interested to read this and I do own this, so that's good. Are we ready for our final pick of the night? It has been just such a joyous occasion to be here with you all, but I'm ready for it to end now. 8.14. Okay, so I don't know what's going on, but I've really only picked like newer additions to my list, which is fine, but like I'm not used to this. <laughs> Straight on till morning. I don't remember this one at, like even a little. Wendy Davenport can't dodge the bank much longer and her family's dire circumstances aren't improving. She knows change is on the horizon. It soon comes in the form of Peter, whose name is whispered in the streets by friends and enemies alike. They call him a wish granter, a miracle worker, a demon. One of these enemies sees an opportunity. Lady Julie Bainbridge, a wealthy woman who knows the truth about the Davenport household. She presents Wendy with a choice, kill Peter and get paid handsomely for her troubles, or all of London will know about her family's ruin. With no other alternative, Wendy journeys to Neverland with the intention of ending Peter's life, a task that may prove even more difficult as her attraction to him continues to grow. Will Wendy be able to strike when it matters most, or will the magic of Neverland and the boy who holds its heart jeopardize all she holds dear? Am I about to read a uh, Peter Pan smut? I am. <laughs> I 100% am. I'm interested in this. This is a retelling, this is a fantasy, this is an adult romance, there's some smut, and the Goodreads page has the trigger, oh hello, the Goodreads page has the trigger warnings, which I always really appreciate. So, in conclusion, oh no, shh, we're gonna ignore that. In conclusion, <laughs> I'm excited to pick this up. I'm really looking forward to this. Okay, <laughs> this is great. So the final book that I want to talk about is the Winers Book Club pick for the month of November. This was Darian's pick as it is going to be on her channel. So let me just pull up the description so I can take a peek at it. But I'm super excited for this. So this is The Lost Apothecary by Sarah Penner. So a female apothecary secretly dispenses poisons to liberate women from men who have wronged them, setting three lives across centuries on a dangerous collision course. Rule number one, the poison must never be 
used to harm another woman. Rule number two, the names of the murderer and her victim must be recorded in the apothecary's register. One cold February evening in 1791, at the back of a dark London alley in a hidden apothecary shop, Nella awaits her newest customer. Once a respected healer, Nella now uses her knowledge for a darker purpose, selling well-disguised poisons to desperate women who would kill to be free of the men in their lives. But when her new patron turns out to be a precocious 12-year-old named Eliza Fanning, an unexpected friendship sets in motion, a string of events that jeopardizes Nella's world and threatens to expose the many women whose names are written in her register. In present-day London, aspiring historian Caroline Parswell spends her 10th wedding anniversary alone, reeling from the discovery of her husband's infidelity. When she finds an old apothecary vial near the River Thames, she can't resist investigating, only to realize she's found a link to the unsolved apothecary murders that haunted London over two centuries ago. As she deepens her search, Caroline's life collides with Nella's and Eliza's in a stunning twist of fate, and not everyone will survive. That sounds incredible. The cover is stunning, beautiful. I love seeing men suffer the consequences of their actions. It is one of my favorite pastimes, and I'm really looking forward to reading this book. I am so thankful that Darian picked this because it's been on my list since I heard about it. I think I heard about it on a couple of people's different channels and I've just been obsessed with the idea of it. So those are all the books I plan on reading in the month of November. This was a very bizarre list for me because most of it is adult fiction which is so different from what I'm used to but I'm kind of interested to see where it goes to see how I react to these different books and I'm, I'm just kind of looking forward to it. So if you've read any of the, these books and you have any opinions you want to discuss let me know in the comments below don't forget to hit that like button leave a comment and of course subscribe if you haven't already i post whenever the heck i get the chance so you will never know and it's it's, it's surprise is always fun so until next time bye readers mm -hmm.